Yeah, so I'll go ahead and begin and we'll do our thing. Okay, sounds good. All right. Hi there. I'm Samantha Hoffman, and I am VP of Chicago Writers Association and Executive Director of Let's Just Write, an Uncommon Writers Conference. Um, thanks for joining us today, or at least trying. <laughs> we, we are having some technical difficulties, and um, sorry for the issue, but Nancy and I are going to go ahead and chat, and you'll be watching this later. So. Our apologies if you tried to get in and couldn't. We hope that won't happen again in the future. Um, I have my cocktail. It's not exactly a cocktail. It's nice a beer. Nancy has water. <laughs> Brand <laughs> have, placement, unfortunately. I don't mean to be, but yeah. <laughs> I only have a beer, and now after our technical difficulties, I wish I had a vodka. I know, right? <laughs> But um, I have the honor of interviewing Nancy Johnson, and Nancy is going to be joining us in um, March of 2022 as a presenter at Let's Just Write, an Uncommon Writers Conference. So we're very excited to have her there. And this is a little preview of what you'll get when you come to the conference. So let me introduce Nancy. Nancy is a native of Chicago's South Side. She worked for more than a decade as an Emmy-nominated, award-winning television journalist at CBS and ABC affiliates and markets nationwide. And that's a whole nother session, Nancy. <laughs> Her debut novel, The Kindest Lie, has been reviewed by the New York Times, the Washington Post, the LA Times. She was featured on Entertainment Weekly's Must List and a whole host of other accolades and reviews and um, too many to mention at this time, which is so great for a debut novel, for any novel, actually. It's everyone's dream, right? Right. Um, Nancy is a graduate of Northwestern University and the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. She lives downtown Chicago and manages brand communications for a large healthcare nonprofit. The Kindest Lie is her first novel. That is just one of the most exciting things, Nancy. It's what every debut novelist hopes for, is to get the kind of press and the kind of um, accolades and attention that you've been getting. Can you just share a little bit about what that is like? It has been so much fun. And thank you for having me, <laughs> first thank of all, you. Samantha. I really appreciate it. And it's been overwhelming, but in the best possible way uh, to have so many people respond favorably to the book because I spent so much time writing it alone. <laughs> you know, it took me six years to write and it was just something that lived in my imagination for such a long time. And now to have it out there in the world and people to appreciate it, it's the best uh, feeling ever. And to receive all the acclaim from these major newspapers and then our hometown paper, the Chicago Tribune featured me yeah, I sent a photographer out to my house to get photos. And yeah, that was just such a fun uh, experience. I felt like a star for, you know, an hour or so. <laughs> but the best part has been the readers who have really um, been gravitating to the book and telling me how much they've enjoyed it. Yeah, so tell me a little bit about that, about the readers who connected with you. Yeah, I mean, I hear from readers in so many um, venues. Uh, and it's interesting that there are a few readers who I've gotten to know, even though I've never met them before. <laughs> and um, particularly these two women named Anissa and Francine. And so they live in different parts of the country, um, but they started following me, you know, once I published this book, The Kindest Lie. And now they come to like practically every event that I have. And it's just so much fun to get that kind of support. I've had readers who said, you know, if you're on tour when things open up again, post pandemic, feel free to, you know, stop here and stay with me overnight, you know, so those kinds of things are just so heartwarming uh, to connect with people. But the main thing is that people are reading the story from all walks of life, and they're saying that they really connect with the characters. And that means the world to me to have people just respond that favorably. I mean, I had one woman who said that her, um, I think it was her mother um, committed suicide. And, uh, and she said, 
that she was really struggling to come to terms with that, but that after um, reading my book, that she found some closure and some healing based on the, the mother-daughter or the grandmother-granddaughter relationship in the book between uh, Mama and um, Ruth. And so that just made, that just took my breath away when I right. um, had someone write to me and say that. that makes if, if you have one response like that, it makes the whole thing worthwhile. It really does. Sure you've had way more than that. Yeah, yeah. I've had, um, yeah, several. That was the one that just really took my breath away. But yeah, I've had a lot of people yeah. just say they've just connected so strongly with it or the sibling relationship between Ruth and her brother Eli reminds them of their own relationship with their brother. And, you know, just, yeah, it's just been um, so gratifying to know that I'm connecting that way with people. Right. And isn't that why we write? To connect yes. with our world. So yeah. true, really. You know, I read um, that someone wrote to you and said that the um, the character of the Black Midwestern grandmother reminded her of her own Jewish and Belgian grandmother who yeah. also made hot water cornbread and keeps bacon grease on the back of the stove. Yeah. And it doesn't this speak to how how much we're how much more we're alike than we are different. Yeah, I think it does speak to that and the universality of story that can connect us across our differences. But at the same time, I do believe, since I'm dealing with issues of race um, in the book, that even though we have so many things that unite us in terms of just our humanity, which is so true, there are also differences too, you know, and that we are um, different in terms of our life experiences in this country. Uh, between Black and white America, it's very different um, and very unique experience. And I think we do need to also, while we're talking about what unifies us, also honor the differences as well and celebrate yeah. those too. So I think we have to do a combination of the two. Right, right. So um, when did you begin writing fiction? So I started with um, fiction long time, well, not a long time ago, I guess around 2012, um, I'd say, is when I started writing uh, fiction because I had a long career as a television journalist. And so I did uh, television news writing for many years, for most of my, um, well, not most, but, you know, for more than a decade, I did that. And so while that was still storytelling, it's different from writing fiction. Uh, obviously, that was nonfiction. And I got to the place where I didn't want to write, only write the stories that were making news. And even after I left news and went into public relations and corporate communications, I also didn't want to just write the stories that were um, uh, promoting what's happening in my organization, as important as those are. I wanted to tell these stories of my own imagination. And so then that's when I really uh, got serious about that around 2012, 2013, and started doing the, um, the fiction writing. So I did a few, uh, wrote a few short stories, uh, not for publication, just for fun. And I entered some contests when I was living in Atlanta. I was part of the Atlanta Writers uh, Association, very similar to the Chicago uh, Writers Association, both you know really great organizations. And they ran contests. And so I just wrote a few short stories and entered those and won second place in a contest um, there. But other than that, it was just the novel writing. And so that's really been my foray into fiction. Yeah, and tell us a little bit about the publishing process with the first book and, you know, how did you go about that? Yeah, so that was a long journey. So it took me six years uh, to write uh, The Kindest Life. And then after that, I was at the point where I needed to find a literary agent. And the agents are the, the gatekeepers, you know, the ones who help you get the book deal and, uh, and introduce you to the world. And I kind of say they're like your escort to the ball of publishing. And I started querying literary agents too early, you know, because I'm thinking, hey, I know how to write. I'm good at this. <laughs> and so, and you know how this is because you, you're, you know, a writer as well, a fiction and an author. And so I thought my book was ready uh, before it really was ready. And so I started querying and the rejections began flooding in. And uh, at that point, I had only had Caroline Levitt, you know, who's a wonderful author. I'd had her uh, read and critique. And so I've made edits based upon her feedback, which was great. And then I started querying, the rejections came in and I got one of the, my rejections was from Danielle Bukowski from Sterling Lord Literistic. And I sent her a thank you note. And when I thanked her, I said, I appreciate this feedback and I plan to revise based on what you've told me as well as others. And she said, well, if you plan to revise, then send it to me again once you've revised. And so then I really got to work and I got five beta readers to read and critique for me. And I went to um, Tin House and workshopped an excerpt there. 
at their summer novel workshop, also did the same at Cambilio Fiction, which is for Black writers. And so after I did that, I did a few rewrites, started querying again. This time I received an offer from Danielle Fukowski and another agent, and I had two choices there. You know, I had a, you know, I was able to choose which um, agent I wanted to go with, and I chose Danielle. And then, so I told you how that process was such a long one, but after I got Danielle, she then submitted my manuscript to publishing houses, and it only took two and a half weeks for us to get a deal. We had two offers, both from imprints of HarperCollins. See, that's another part of the dream. Yes. Mostly those offers don't come like that. But. Don't come like that, or it takes forever to, you know, to get uh, a deal. So I was just, yeah, I wasn't expecting that since it had taken so long to get the agent. But, right. it was great. Right. but then, of course, the editing continued with my editor at the publishing house, as you know. Yeah, yeah, which is such a great thing to go. Yeah. It's, uh, to me, it's one of the main reasons that you want to go with a traditional publisher because you have the benefit of that editor. Yes. You know, I mean, you can, you can contract with other editors, but right. when you have a book deal, you get an editor and that's really- Yeah, an editor comes with that. And I, like, I always tell my editor, uh, Liz Stein, she's incredible at William Morrow, uh, which is an imprint of Harper Collins. And you know, I tell her all the time that she took the vision that I had for this book that was in my head and helped translate that to the page. You know, and that's the best you can ever ask for. Right, because you spent six years with this story. And so yeah. things you think are on the page are not on the page, or right. things you don't think are on the page are there. Are on the page, I know. Yeah, you get it. You know exactly what I'm talking about. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Um, we're going to move on to writing from the lens of color, but I'd like to know a little bit about your inspiration for this story. And, yeah. Uh, and your main character, Ruth. Yeah, so I was inspired by the events of um, 2008 when uh, Obama, Barack Obama was elected president. It was a time of um, a lot of hope for my family and I think for many in the black community and even in other communities too, because I think a lot of people felt that we had transcended a barrier when it came to race in the country by electing our first black president and we really had. At the same time, I kept hearing that we are now post-racial as a country and I knew that was not true that that was a fallacy. Um, you know, Facebook was really just, I think, getting going then, or at least I was new to Facebook in 2008. And I just remember seeing this vitriol, the bitter divide between black and white communities uh, that was playing out in my social media feed. And um, so I knew we were not post-racial. And I kept hearing many in particularly the working class white community, uh, particularly on the news saying, you don't see us, you don't hear us in our struggles. And so I just knew there were these pockets and parts of America that were feeling unseen and unheard and it was really contributing also to the divide. And so I was interested in telling that story. I kept thinking about it. And so that's how I came up with uh, the book. And I decided then, of course, I don't want to write a treatise on race. You know, I'm interested in fiction. And so I, want, I need a story. And to have a story, I needed the characters. And then that's how I created uh, Ruth and Midnight um, to tell the story. I don't hear, I think you're muted. So. I muted myself because of all the motorcycles that are <laughs> oh. up and down the street. Yeah, the beauties of living in the city. <laughs> um, uh, oh, how does, um, how does the election of Barack Obama inform your story? Yeah, so uh, it's interesting that, so on Goodreads, um, which is a reader site, you know, I had someone asked on there, is this book a political book? Because I think they see the, you know, the back of the book or the inside flap and it talks about um, Obama and the election of 2008 launching the book. Um, and then someone answered and said, no, not political at all. And in many ways that's true, it's not a political book. Um, and so Obama's presence in there is very limited. It's really, the book opens, the novel opens with an election night watch party, uh, you know, where my main character Ruth and her, her husband and their friends are in this celebratory mode and, you know, just waiting for the election results to come in. And of course, once he's elected president, they're just there dancing and singing and it's a time of hope and celebration. And so that's really where you see Obama is in that first opening uh, scene. And I was interested in starting the book with that period of hope uh, in the country and then showing what happens later once you have the lack of hope and you lose some of that hope, uh, particularly because we were dealing with um, the Great Recession uh, you know, so 
there was a lot of reason that you know people were still struggling in spite of whatever progress was being made. But yeah, so Obama's really just about setting the tone and the, the tenor and the time period that we're in. And, and this is such a, a complex issue and so multifaceted. How did you, how did you go about addressing this, this massive issue? Yeah, I, I really believe that it was about, you know, telling a story, like I said, and not, you know, I didn't want to write something that was going to be moralistic or didactic in any way. Um, you know, I'm not trying to get across any kind of a message or a political agenda, but it was really um, telling a story and having these characters that are multifaceted and very complex. And I didn't want to have any heroes or villains in the book. I wanted it to be where everybody has a point. Every character has a point in the story. And, um, and also when I thought of Ruth and Midnight telling this story about race and class, I was interested in the nuances of who they are. And so you've got Ruth, who is this Ivy League educated, very successful uh, black engineer. Yet there's a scene in the book where she and her husband are on the L train and they're sitting there where a, when a white cop is hassling a black boy who's beating or not beating drums, but drumming for um, money for tips. And they're sitting there rigid with fear and nothing violent has happened, but they're fearful because of the pervasive violence that they've seen and they know what could happen. And also Ruth on her job, you know, she's one of the few black folks, uh, you know, in her company and she's not getting the promotions that she believes she deserves. She's not getting the, the best assignments. And because of that, you know, she's still facing racism. You know, she's still a black woman in America in spite of the fact that she's in a higher socioeconomic back bracket. And then on the other end of the spectrum, you have Midnight, who is this white boy who is poor. You know, his father has just lost his job at the auto plant. His grandmother is struggling to keep her business afloat. Yet he's able to move through the world of Ganton, Indiana, where the book is set a lot more freely and easily than his black and brown friends and classmates can. So that's really how I approached it. And I know readers have said, I read somewhere that readers said they don't see color in your book. Can mm -hmm. you react to that? Yeah, yeah. So I did an interview uh, with uh, Boswell Books in Milwaukee. And um, when I did that interview, it was with Shannon Sims, who is a black anchor at WTMJ in Milwaukee. She's the one who uh, was my conversation partner. And I was talking to her kind of like you and I just did a little bit ago about the universality of the story. I said, I have a lot of readers who have told me, you know, mainly white readers, but I didn't say that, but I think it was probably obvious that who said, oh, I don't really see color in the book. It's really about, I see the family relationships and I see all these other elements of the book. And uh, Shannon gave me this look, this side eye kind of like, really? You know, <laughs> she said, yeah, they don't see race because they don't want to see it. You know, and anyone who doesn't see that in your book is someone who's not interested in seeing it because it's so obvious that, you know, that it's a part of the book. And I hadn't really thought about it that way. And then when she said, it, I was like, yeah, that's true. I totally agreed with her about that. And, um, and I think that's an issue. You know, we, we can't be colorblind. And, and I hear that a lot too, when I go into reader communities on Facebook and I, you know, do giveaways for my book and I ask questions and Sometimes I avoid the race thing because I'm like, oh God, I don't know what kind of responses I'm going to get here. But then sometimes I do bring it up and I um, ask people about their thoughts on what can we do about racism in America. And I get a lot of responses that, oh, I don't see color. And that's a problem if you don't see color. First of all, I believe people are not telling the truth if they say they don't see color. Of course you see color, <laughs> unless you're visually impaired, you know, but you see color in, in this terms of seeing race is what I mean. You know, they see differences in race. And, and it's a problem if you don't see it because I want you to see it. I believe if you don't see me as a black woman, then that's erasing who I am, a large part of who I am, you know, and, I, and who wants to be erased? Right, right, exactly. Um, and why did you make Midnight White? Yeah, well, it's interesting that you asked that because um, in an early, you know, we talked about all the rewriting and the revising of a book in the very, when I first started writing this book, I was maybe four or five chapters into the book, Midnight was black. <laughs> and so, and then uh, I hadn't gotten far, luckily, before I decided I wanted to make the change, but it was pretty much the same story, except he was black. You know, and my main character, Ruth, was um, going back to her hometown of Canton, Indiana, to search for the son that she walked away from 
uh, you know, 11 years ago. And so, and then when she got there, she met and formed this unlikely friendship at the time with this 11 year old um, black boy. But then I kept thinking about what I was really intending to do with the book. And I talked about, you know, I talked to you about the election of Obama and how I wanted to show this divide between black and white America. And I felt that it would be more effective and a richer story if I could not only show it from a white boy's perspective, but also be able to introduce readers to his family as well. And, uh, and so that would just open up a whole new world for me in the book. And so that's why I decided to make the change. You know, if I want to talk about the division between black and white America, you know, let's have a black woman and a white boy bring that story to life. And do you think that, that those relationships between Midnight and Ruth and his family and her family, do you think that tells the story you want to tell? I think so. Um, <clears throat> one thing is I had to get over, and this is as a black author, I was really struggling for a while with how do I represent my own community? Because there's so many poor representations and misrepresentations of what it means to be black in America. And so I had to get over that and just tell a story with rich, complex, nuanced, complicated characters. And that's what I believe I've done. And so when I look at what I, what I accomplished with telling the story of Ruth and um, Midnight, I didn't tell a full, com the complete story of what it means to be black and what it means to be white <laughs> in America, because that's impossible to do with one book. And so I had to go easy on myself and be realistic that that's not going to happen. And I think readers have to understand that no matter what book you come to and read, it's not going to tell the full story of what it means to be black or what it means to be white in America. It's only one experience of that. And so I think in that sense, I did, I, think, I believe I was very successful in telling this one story of this one experience uh, in America at that particular time of great economic anxiety. And don't you think that one story um, is expanded around the world? I mean, every yeah. so many people have that story or can see themselves yeah. in that story. Mm -hmm. I think people can. Yeah, for sure. I think a lot of people can identify with it. Um, and it's interesting. So many people, uh, when they read the book, they think, did she write that during the Trump years, you know, the past four years? And because it's such a mirror for what we've just, you know, experienced the last four years. When you look at, you know, my book set in 2008 could very well have been set, you know, at some point in like in 2020, for example, you know, it, it's a very, or even 2021, it's a very um, similar story. And, you know, for better or for worse, you know, in some ways it's, things aren't changing the way as fast as, you know, we would like for them to. And you're seeing a lot of the repeat of some of those same things um, with the economic anxiety. First of all, of we had the great recession in 2008. Now we're dealing with a global pandemic. People are losing their livelihoods. You know, back then we, we elected um, a president and it was a historic election that gave people so much hope. And then we saw, you know, um, last year, the election of Kamala Harris as our vice president, the first time we've had a black and South Asian and a woman, you know, as our vice president. So again, very historic and also a time of hope. But in the midst of that hope, we still are so broken as a country. You know, you look at just after that election that gave people so much of a feeling of promise, you look at the insurrection of the Capitol, right. you know, everything that was about. So you see how far we still have to go. Right. Do you think, how do you think this may, this is coming out of left field for you, but how do you think Fine. your story would be different if you wrote it in the last 12 years, or if you wrote it last year after the killing of George Floyd? Mm. I think if I were writing that um, same story, a lot of what it would, you know, I'd be looking at what were the roots of Trumpism, you know, and possibly, you know, having some flashbacks to 2008 and to the Obama presidency and what that meant, because I think those two are so linked, um, because I believe it was 2011, around there, when we saw the rise of birtherism, which is something that, that Trump, you know, put out there. And, you know, it's like, around that time is when he was really, in many ways, beginning his ascendancy, you know, his campaign to be president and it was all you know hinging on the idea of delegitimizing America's first black president. So there would still be, I think, 
some vestiges of that um, in the story, even if I were writing it uh, now. But I think some of that economic um, anxiety that would still be there if I had written the book last year. Um, you know, the, the police, um, police violence against black communities. You know, we saw that during the Obama years. And then of course, you know, last year, if I was telling a story of what was happening last year, you know, you know we would have George Floyd in there. You know, right. we would have Breonna Taylor in there and countless other stories and of people that whose names we don't know. Yes, right. Um, what was your inspiration for Ruth, the, a woman who leaves a baby behind? Yeah. I know. It's interesting because I didn't start with that. You know, I, um, like I said, I started with the, the whole race class piece. Um, and then I was like, what, what, you know, what is the story there? You know, I need a real story. And then that's where I came up with it. And I don't know where I came up with that. It was brainstorming and just thinking about it and trying to figure out um, where could I go? And, I, and for some reason I was interested in a, the woman and child dynamic. And so that kind of speaks to the idea of motherhood. Um, and so I thought that would be interesting to explore motherhood. And also when I kept going back to the election of Obama again, and the hope, some of that hope, as you saw in the first chapter in that election night celebration scene, a lot of the hope, it's not just about transcending a barrier for the country, but it was about people believing that there was opportunity and hope for their children. You know, that this is the kind of world I can bring children into and the children that I have, that they can be anything. And so that was interesting too thinking about children. And so then that also feeds into the idea of motherhood. And so it's like, okay, well, what about a woman who has a child already, but she doesn't know what conditions he's in. She's left a bit. She's successful. She's living the dream, <laughs> you know, similar to what Obama is living. She's living a dream in her own sphere of influence, but yet she believes she's left her son mired in the very poverty and lack of opportunity that she managed to escape. And so that, that seemed like a really interesting uh, thing to tackle for me. That's, yeah, that's a really interesting dynamic. And I have to admit, I haven't finished your book, but I'm anxious oh. to. <laughs> okay, that's fine. At least we know there won't be any spoilers. You haven't finished that. <laughs> um, and um, there's a scene where Ruth is driving through her hometown and she <laughs> clicks her car doors locks them as she's driving through because she's afraid and she, she doesn't like what that says about her but it's a it's a real thing yeah how do you think that would play if a white writer wrote that hmm. I don't think that would play as well <laughs> uh even for me I struggled with whether I wanted to put that in there and uh you know, and I've talked to black readers about it and everybody's like, oh yeah, I mean, that's a thing. You know, I mean, nobody said that was an issue, but for me, like I was saying earlier, I was struggling so much with this burden of responsibility as a black author, you know, feeling the, the weight of my own community on my shoulders and everything I write and about representation. And so I kept thinking, okay, is that a really negative thing to actually put in there? But I thought, you know what? I want the story to be complex and I want it to be real and, and that's a, a real thing that I could see, you know, a black woman doing, you know. Um, and so it, part of it, you know, and I saw it two different ways. Part of it is this idea of just, well, I'm in this area and I think it's kind of sketchy. And so I'm, you know, no matter who it is, I'm just, you know, clicking my locks here. And then there's the other way you could look at it as internalized um, racism and hatred that comes from white supremacy and making you um, as a black person, you know, denigrate your own people, you know, so I was interested in that too. So I thought it could play on several different um, levels, but to answer your, the other part of your question, you know, about white writers, I, I don't know if that would play well, um, because there are just so many nuances to that and in ways in which I don't know if a white author could really understand the complexity uh, of something like that and what it means to be black. And I don't know if that would be received well by black audiences, you know, the way it is when a black author tells it. It's almost like, you know, and this is not necessarily in writing books, but there was a period where I used, we used to hear in the news talk 
controversy about the N-word. And, you know, you had some white folks saying, well, well, black people say that, you know, in their music and, and all, you know, and all that. And to each other, I hear black people say it. Why can't I say it? And it's kind of like, you have to kind of check yourself. Why do you want to say that? No, you can't say it, first of all. Just, you just can't. And then why do you want to? You know, interrogate that. What is it that makes you want to say that? And it's very different, you know, coming from somebody white versus somebody uh, black in the community. Yeah. You know, it's just, it's so hard to navigate the world of race today and yes. to know, you know, what's appropriate and what isn't. And, and the, the most important thing is to try to understand each other, you know, yeah. and talk to each other. And I think, I think books like yours help that. Yeah. And so what do you think about how does fiction enter into this conversation and how does fiction help us to move forward? Yeah, it's um, interesting that last year, so many people after George Floyd's death, you had a lot of white Americans in particular who were doing their anti-racism reading, uh, reading a lot of nonfiction books. And I know many who were and who were calling me up. Oh, guess what I'm reading? And uh, Hi, uh, oh, there's your cat. <laughs> Join in the conversation. Join in the conversation. I know, misses you. But uh, yeah, so you had a lot of uh, white folks saying, you know, doing their anti racism reading last year after the death of George Floyd. And I think there's a place for that, for sure. What do you mean, by, what do you mean by that, anti racism reading? Oh, the, the lists, all the, you know, when George Floyd um, was killed last year. You had, you know, so many people putting out reading lists, and so everybody was not everybody, but a lot of white people were doing their doing. That's what it was called, the like anti-racism list. Okay. Like they were reading, you know, how to be anti-racist. They were reading the book by was it Robin D'Angelo? I think it was the book. Um, the one of those books about white privilege, and um, you know, so there was a whole list of mainly nonfiction books that were being recommended if you were you know, on the news, people were recommending those reading lists that if you really wanted to learn about racism and about white privilege and all that, these are the lists of the books. And those books hit the, the New York Times bestseller list immediately. You know, those were the books um, to be reading at that time. And I think there was a place for that. And I think it was great that people were reading and learning. However, I think there's also defensiveness that comes with some of that. Like, oh, I'm reading about racism. Well, that's not me, you know? That's somebody else or something that happened, you know, hundreds of years ago, that's not me. And it was difficult to, for some people to connect with that. Whereas fiction, I think, is a bit more deceptive and it works, you know, at you on a different level. And through character and story, you're able to understand racism and really empathize. Like you were saying, you know, I'm empathized by walking in the shoes and seeing through the lens of other people whose lives you may not know anything about until you read the book and you fall into the story and it kind of catches you off guard in understanding. I, you know, I think that's, I, I think that's the most important thing that fiction does is shows you these points of view from people who you know, you know, right. They right. might be you, they might be a friend, they might, but you, you get that point of view. Yeah, yeah, and it humanizes it. And even if it's a perspective that, you know, it's not your life or the life of your people in your family or even your people you know, it's different from just reading, you know, um, um, a, a paragraph about, you know, something that's more clinical and analytical to explain this is what white privilege is. It's different when you're reading about this 11 year old white boy named Midnight and you see in a scene, you know, white privilege at play. Right. You know, before, um, before last year and before Black Lives Matter, and even like maybe when that movement and the protests started and people would say that, um, talk about white privilege. And yeah. I, I remember somebody said something like that on, a, on Facebook. And I said, and maybe referring to me, I'm not sure, but I said, I'm not privileged. I didn't grow up, my parents didn't have money. I, they didn't send me to private school or, you know, to college. I worked from the time I was young and I earned everything that I got. And, and you know, it took me a while to understand that it's not about 
what you did and what you got in your life. It's about starting out with this color skin. Yeah. It already gives you, I, I, t I take umbrage with the term white privilege. It's not privilege, it's an advantage, right? I mean, mm -hmm. it's not my privilege to be white, it's my advantage that I'm white and I'm able to navigate the world in a way that a black person who's, you know, maybe just like me in other ways would yeah. not be able to. Exactly. And, you know, I think that it, it's enlightening when you learn things like that. And I think you learn it from fiction as much as you learn it from um, doing your races and reading. Yeah, I agree. And, and so I asked the question back then and I continue to ask it what can I do as a white woman of privilege or advantage to further this understanding? Yeah, I think there is work that we can do on a personal level and then on a larger um, level. Uh, part of it is just understanding and recognizing. Um, I think it certainly frustrated me. And I know it's true that a lot of people just kind of were waking up to this last year, but I have to admit it was very frustrating to me that it took um, a white cop kneeling on the neck of a black man for now we know more than nine minutes for some in white America to first of all recognize my humanity and, and then to recognize you know their own um, privilege or advantage however we want to talk about it so I think what we can do about it is make sure this is not just a moment in time because you know a lot of people were out there marching and uh you know, with their signs. And I thought that was wonderful. And it was nice that it was such a multicultural mix of people last year. And it wasn't just black people or Hispanic people, it was all kinds of people, white people, everybody, Asian community, everybody was out there. Uh, and that was important. But I remember after the, kind of on the tail end of the marches and I heard from a woman um, that I'd worked with many years ago, a white woman. And, um, and she said to me, I wanna do something more. I wanna do something more. And then she said, what do you think of me um, starting a, uh, you know, uh, my, uh, my own protest march in my community. And I said, you could do that. I said, but I think there's so many other things that you could do that are probably even more impactful at this point. I think the marches that gets the attention of people and the media, and then that kind of builds it and makes it more visible for people. And that's important to call attention to an issue. But I think now I said in your own sphere of influence is where you need to, I believe, be active. And so I think it depends on who you are and where you are. You know, is your, you know, what about your community you're in? Is it an, you know, is it an all white community? Are you, you know, saying we want to make sure we have people of other races in this community, in this school system? You know, are you willing to have your kids be going to school with black kids and Hispanic kids? You know, that's important. Um, there's all this, you know, legislation and everything that's happening right now with voter suppression that is rooted in racism. What are you doing about that? You know, are you, you know, active and using your, it's really about whether you call it privilege or advantage, it's about using whatever that influence is for good, you know, and are you using it um, to build something more equitable and to dismantle uh, racism wherever you, you see it um, and wherever it exists. I think that's um, very important. Um, in the industry of um, like the, the, the world we're in with books and, and publishing, um, I think it's, about when you have your panels at your conferences, you know, it's, do you have people of color who are there? Do you have people of color who are making the decisions about how this conference is going to be run? What are the topics that we're gonna be talking about? Um, you know, I've been to, and I go to lots of uh, writing conferences and I have for a number of years. And, you know, it's interesting that you go to some and the, you look at the text that's used in the examples and workshops that you sit in or just small um, sessions that you're in. And a lot of times the text is primarily from white authors, the examples that are given. You know, why don't we see examples from, from black literature there and more prominently? And there are some conferences that do it and do it well, but those are like examples of really getting the experience out there. Um, going back to schools, um, you know, I think about people who have kids in school, they're going to PTA meetings, they're talking to teachers and um, making sure the curriculum, you know, in that same vein is, has expanded to include people of color in terms of the books that you are reading. And as I realized myself, I was talking to my high school English teacher about a year ago 
And I told him that, you know, and I went to St. Ignatius College Prep and, uh, and I was, we were having a great conversation. And I said, why weren't we reading? Why didn't we read Toni Morrison or James Baldwin or any of that when we were in high school? And he admitted that, you know, that was a problem. And he said, eventually they did start to do that. Um, but I was there in the, uh, in the eighties, you know, late eighties and we weren't. And so I think diversifying the curriculum, you know, when you're teaching younger kids, black history, um, and you talk about Rosa Parks, for example, not saying she's just a seamstress who got tired one day and decided to, you know, plop down on the first seat she could find, but that was part of a larger movement. And that was very much strategic and organized. That was planned that she was going to take that seat when she did, you know, it was part of a much larger uh, organized uh, movement, teaching people that you teach Martin Luther King Jr. Go beyond the I have a dream speech. He has a lot more interesting and revolutionary um, speeches and writings. So those are just a few examples, I think, of things people can do. And sometimes it's just in your own family and you're having your family gathering, whether it's Easter or Passover or whatever you're celebrating with your family. And you got Uncle Joe at the you know dinner table making the racist joke, having the courage to speak up and say, no, this is not what we're going to do here. Right, right. Um, I just read a book that I want to recommend. I think mm -hmm. it should be recommended reading for everyone. It's called, I haven't finished it yet, but it's called Think Again. Mm -hmm. Are you familiar with it? It's uh, it by? Grant is the author. What was the name again? I'm sorry. Think Again. Mm -hmm. um, the tagline is The Power of Knowing What You Don't Know. And okay. it's really enlightening to me about how to listen to each other, mm -hmm. and how not to be stuck in our views that we just become stuck in because it's what we've always known. Yeah. So, it, I mean, it's a- it's Oh, a I'm gonna great, look that up. Yeah. And who did you say the author is of Think Again? Um, Adam Grant. Okay. So I recommend that to everyone. I think it should be required reading in schools today. Oh, that's good. And the other one that I'm just starting as well that I would recommend that I think a lot of people know about is Cast by Isabel Wilkerson. Have you read that one yet? No. No. C-A-S-T-E. Oh. Cast, as in a cast system. Yeah, I mean, that's one that's, I mean, it was, I mean, I think that one's probably going to win a Pulitzer, just like her first book did. Um, but uh yeah, I mean, a lot of the things that I talk about in The Kindest Lie in terms of the divisions, she does all the research and analyzes the roots of all of that around the world. You know, so she you know, talk, is talking about Nazi Germany and what happened there and the, just the roots of that and this whole idea of a caste system and how, how this has been orchestrated, you know, and it's designed this way, um, you know, for us to always have this stratification. And there's always somebody, some group that you want to have below you. And in America, quite often, that's Black people who are at the bottom of that caste right. system here, in this country, at least. Um, and so even if you're poor and you're white, you know, oh, at least I'm not Black. You know, that, um, yeah, I mean, there's that mentality. Um, and yeah. then this um, kind of zero sum game too of, you know, feeling that if there's a dollar in, you know, your pocket, maybe that means that's gonna be a dollar less in mine. You know, if you and your family get something that's less for me and for my family, and it's unfortunate, but that's really the mindset um, that's reinforced in this country. Yeah, yeah. And who's the author? Uh, oh, um, Isabel Wilkerson for Cast. Okay. Yep, Isabel Wilkerson. She she wrote Warmth of the Warmth of Other Suns. Oh yeah. Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. About the Great Migration some years yeah. ago. Yeah. Yeah, but this one, Cast, Oprah um, had her on. It was Oprah pick. Well, I don't know, it's a while back now, uh, the cast is, and I know Oprah uh, sent copies of cast to like all the top CEOs in the country and said, you need oh, to read this. Oh, yeah. That's great. Mm -hmm. You know, speaking of Oprah picks, I'm sure last year you're aware of um, the book, American Dirt. Oh yeah. Oh, I'm aware of the, the book. I haven't read it, but I know of the book. Yeah. It was, um, it was an Oprah pick and then it just got, so much publicity, there was so much discussion because it's a story of Mexican immigrants fleeing to America and it's written by a, a white woman. Yeah. People said she had no right to, to write that story. What do you think about that? You know, I haven't read American Dirt, so I can't comment on that particular book specifically, but I have heard of the controversy 
I will comment more broadly though on um, white authors and writing stories outside of their experience, particularly I will say writing black characters because that's more of what I know. And before this book published, I've had a lot of white writers approach me who I know from different writing communities and say, I wanna write black characters, but I'm afraid. I don't know what to do. And I think you even alluded to it, Samantha, earlier in our conversation here, there is this fear and I get it, this kind of, oh my God, I, should I even tackle it all? Because you know I'm going to get it wrong. I'm going to make a mistake. Somebody's going to be mad, <laughs> and um, and I get it. You know I understand it's frustrating. And even in my answers, I think it's probably, you know, ambiguous too about what to do. But um, I say I always tell white authors first of all, ask yourself, am I the right person to tell the story? Why do I want to tell the story? I think that's important uh, because I believe for some, not for all, but for some they see that publishing is trying to make some changes and they believe that, oh, diversity, maybe that's gonna sell books, you know? And so I need to do this or I'm not gonna sell a book unless I've got, you know, somebody black, somebody Hispanic, somebody Asian in the book, you know? And, and that's not the right way, I don't think, to approach it because you're not gonna do the story any justice if you're just trying to check a box demographically. Um, but yes, but deciding why you wanna tell it and if you decide that you are the person to tell it, I think then it's about doing it right, doing it justice, doing your homework. Uh, I often tell white authors, before you write black characters, get to know real black people first, because um, you really don't want to tell a story, of, you know, you don't have any, you don't even know anybody who's black, <laughs> but you're going to tell a story of what the black experience, or what a segment of the black experience is, you can't do it and do that well. So it's really getting to know black people, having, um, you know, having them read, you know, the book too, and, and give you feedback on where you may have erred, uh, and avoiding tropes and stereotypes. That's a big one too, because when some authors, not all, but some writers have sent me excerpts to read where they've had black characters, quite often it's very stereotypical. And the black character, I don't care who they are, they're all breaking verbs like glass, you know, they're yeah. just butchering the English language. And I'm like, really, is that what it means to be black to you? that it's all, it's about broken English, you know, and, or either the characters have no depth and they're just sidekicks to the white character or there to support them or serve them in many ways, you know, so trying to avoid those kinds of tropes. So if you're going to include the character, maybe you don't want them to be your um, main point of view character, which I think is what a lot of people do. They don't want to do that because that's really a big responsibility. But if you have a secondary character who's black, for example, it would be good still to give them an arc, you know, have a character arc. Sure, and sure. give them a family you know what i mean sometimes these black people just descend on a story and they have no history no family they are just nothing they're just there all of a sudden yeah yeah, yeah. you want to avoid that that's checking a box just checking the box yeah yeah but it's hard it's really hard to to do but i think some people their hearts are in the right place with wanting to do it i think but it's just about doing it right but the other thing i would tell folks is um some people come back at you and they're very defensive about it and say, I have a right, the right to write anything I want to write. And you really do. You can write anything you want to write, but you also will be or open to or need to, will have to be open to the critique you'll get because people are going to critique it. You know, so you can write it, but you're going to be critiqued and you just have to be ready for that. Right. And you have to pay attention to it and yeah. you have to be open to it. You have to be open to it. Yeah. Or you should be at least. Yeah. yeah, or you're going to have a problem <laughs> if you're not. You're going to self-publish. Right. <laughs> That's true. Um, how is your approach different when you wrote your Black characters and your white characters? Hmm. That's an interesting question. I um, The Black characters, um, well, actually all of the characters, um, I felt like there was a part of me in them, and I was able to bring myself and my own life experiences to them. You know, for Ruth, it's like, I understand being a black woman in America, a professional woman, and it's kind of that duality of identity of, um, you know, being in white spaces on the job and then moving into black spaces when you go back to your community or your family. And so I understood that with Ruth. Uh, and then the same thing with all the other characters too, the black ones. Uh, and then people ask me about writing a white character and what I did to, you know, make that happen. And Interestingly, Midnight is very much like me because um, I was bullied as a child and I understand what it's like to stand on the outside of things as Midnight does and to 
not feel that you belong, but to be desperate to belong and to be liked. And so I infused his character with that part of me and my childhood. So in that sense, you know, we had so much in common and it was a lot easier to write his character because I just took myself back to being a little girl and what I experienced, what I felt, the emotions from that. But also it's different from we were, what we were just talking about in terms of a white author writing a black character. So I often tell people that I'm fluent in whiteness, you know, from having gone to white schools and worked in predominantly or all white environments uh, in the work world. So it, it was not a stretch for me to create the white characters, whether it be Midnight or, you know, Butch or Lena, you know, the, his family. Uh, so it was not the same leap that I think a white author would have to make. Right. I think more Black people have experience with white people in their lives yes. because that's the dynamic that's that the white dynamic. people do with Black people. Exactly. So I think whatever we write and whatever characters we write, we just need to be authentic yeah. you know, and, and know who they are. You know, yeah. that's interesting about Midnight. I was wondering if there's, are there any other experiences in your, from growing up that you put into the book, the story? Regarding Midnight? No, regarding uh, any, any, any characters or just. Um, yeah. Um, well, speaking of Midnight, I had an experience that was somewhat similar to the, to, just slightly similar to the Ruth Midnight uh, experience. Um, a long time ago when I was working as a news reporter in Florida, I was in, where was I, Tampa Bay, and I was in a mentor program, a professional mentor organization, and I had a mentee, uh, a girl um, who was a Black girl, biracial, um, white mother, Black father, but her mom was not in her life, not present, and so she was raised by her Black father, but even though she was biracial and Black, she presented very white looking. And so she looked very white, but when she would speak, you could hear the tenor of her voice and, you know, and all that. But anyway, um, she definitely gravitated to me as a mentor um, because I was a black woman and, 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 and she was somebody who was hungering for that mothering. You know, she needed a mother figure. She didn't have a mother in her life. And I mean, I probably only knew her for about maybe a year or a little less than a year. But just an, even like the second or third time we went did an outing together, she was clinging to me as a mother figure. And so, and I, and I kept thinking back to that when I was creating the relationship that Midnight developed so quickly in two, you know, over a two week period with Ruth. And so it was the same thing with this girl that, you know, I just felt that sense of clinging and um, because she was so desperate for that uh, relationship. And so that's an example that, you know, really in some ways came from my, my own experience. Yeah, you know, so many first-time authors write something that's sort of autobiographical, mm -hmm. but it doesn't sound like you did that at all. This is not autobiographical, and yeah, in the sense that I've had some people at conferences say, oh, well, are you an engineer? No, <laughs> or did you have a baby when you were yeah. 17? Like, no, I'm not a mother at all. At all. Anyway, I don't have any children. Yeah. So yeah, so very different from my own life, but I think for me, it's about digging into the emotions that the characters are experiencing. And I'm able to draw upon my own uh, life experiences, even if it's not exactly like the characters, but what I felt in that moment. Yeah. And, um, and I bring that to them. Right. So I understand you have a book deal for your second mm -hmm. book. Can you tell us anything about that? I do, I do. So this just got announced recently. Um, I have a new deal with, book deal with William Morrow, Harper Collins again for a second book. And it's called People of Means, and it's dual timeline. And so it's set in 1960 and 1992. Okay. And it's a book about an upper class or more affluent Black mother and daughter, both of them coming of age at different uh, national moments of racial reckoning. And so the mother is coming of age in Nashville in 1960 as a student at Fisk University during the time of the sit-ins there. And then her daughter is coming of age in Chicago in 1992, but is heavily influenced by what she's seeing with the LA riots uh, when the four officers were acquitted for the beating of Rodney King. And so it's really looking at love and identity, sense of purpose, how they each feel about resistance um, at, at these moments of, um, of racial reckoning. So I'm excited about it. And 
<laughs> and why did you pick those time frames? Um, <clears throat> excuse me. I was really picked the um, the 1961 is the one that came to me first. Um, at, you know the um, at that time the sit-ins, and I was thinking about it for two reasons. One. Um, the idea of resistance had come to me and what it means and how different people look at resistance. And that was actually during that period last year that came to me when, after the George Floyd um, death, his murder, that I was just looking at people who were resisting and how they were doing it and thinking about um, Black Lives Matter, which we were just talking about and how back in, I forget what year it was, but it was some years ago, when Ferguson, Missouri, when the protests were happening then for the shooting death of Michael Brown, uh, that was during the Obama uh, years, how Black Lives Matter was like kind of considered subversive to some, you know, like that was, a, you know, when you would mention, when someone would mention Black Lives Matter, people were like, all lives matter or blue lives matter or, you know what I mean? Yes. There was always that response to Black Lives Matter and, you know, uh, it was kind of a dirty term in a way. And then you look at last year, you know, Black Lives Matter led the way, I think, in a lot of the protest movement, you know, and you have people of all races who were part of that. And so just thinking about what resistance means, means, and that's what kind of got me interested in the topic. And then toward um, later last year, when um, Representative John Lewis died, uh, I was watching some of the documentaries about his life. Yeah. And, and of course, he was part of the the student sit-ins because he was a student at Fisk University in Nashville. So that was kind of the beginning of his oh. involvement with the movement and with Dr. King was beginning in Nashville. And so then that's how that part came to me was through his experience and his life. And I think I'm going to, I haven't gotten to this because I've still got to write the book and I've only written a few chapters, but I think I'm going to sprinkle in that John is, John Lewis is at different locations, oh, you know, which will be great. fun. Yeah. Yeah. That's great. He, you know, he was way before his time. He was, he you know, really so was. Many of those leaders were, and you know, it's taken us so long to listen. Right, right. And so that's how I came up with that 1960 timeline. And then I was thinking, well, I wanna look at another like generation uh, and how they view resistance and what that means for them. And so then I thought, okay, this main character I started with, she's gonna have a daughter. And then I was thinking, okay, about what age could she be? What could be going on at that time? And uh, 1990s, you know, that got me thinking about, you know, the resistance then. And then the Rodney King, yeah, was the thing. Well, I look forward to finishing The Kindest Lie and to your new book. When Thank it you. Out. It'll and be like 2023, I believe, probably. Yeah. Well, you have to write it. That takes a while. You gotta write it. That takes a while. And then, as you know, the publishing journey is like, you know, yeah. a year to a year and a half, you know, right. to make a book. <laughs> yeah. Well, this has been so delightful, Nancy, getting yes. to know you and, and having this important conversation. Yeah, this has been really good. Thank you so much for having me. I'm excited to join you next year. I can't wait. I think, you know, everyone, you'll join us next year, March 19th and 20th of 2022. And it's going to be a wonderful event because it's so long since we've gotten together. And we had two conferences, Nancy, I don't know if I told you that, but we had two before we had to shut down the third. And it's such a wonderful group of people who are so just wanting to get together and to take advantage of this opportunity, this community and learn and help each other and support. It's just, it's wonderful. So I'm so happy you're joining us. Oh, thank you. This will be my first one, I think. Yeah. So really I'm excited to join the community. Oh, yeah. Good. Good. I'm sorry for all these sirens. Okay. <laughs> it's busy. <laughs> it's busy. Well, thank you so much again. I look forward to seeing you live and in person. Yes. And I'm excited for it. And thanks everybody who's watching. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Um, hopefully, we won't have Zoom issues in the future, but. It turned out fine. It, it did, fine. it did. We had a great conversation and I appreciate it. Yeah, and we'll be posting this on our Facebook page, which people will already know because that's where they'll be watching it. So I don't know why I'm even bothering to say that. <laughs> <laughs> but thanks again, Nancy. All right, thank you. Take care. Bye.